Uh, tonight we have Mike Peace uh, giving a demonstration for us. And Mike is one of those great treasures of our, our, of our club because he can do just about anything. He can always give great demonstrations. Yes, you, Mike. Um, and the, one of the things that I've always worried about is overusing him because it's an easy thing to do because he can cover any topic we have. And, uh, and so um, Mike doesn't want it to be the Mike P show every week uh, or every month, but he's uh, graciously going to do the one on maintenance for the lathe. And it's a really good thing to understand that lathes do kind of start to wear out, but there's ways to take care of them, make them last longer. And Mike's going to give us a few tips on that tonight. He wants it to be very interactive, so if you got questions, raise your hand. If you got uh, suggestions or ideas, I'll let us know. But I do have a plan on how we're going to go through it, so uh, kind of hold it until we get to that part of the lathe that you got your question about, because we're going to go from uh, A to Z. Uh, I'm not a machinist. I'm not an engineer. I probably should have been an engineer, but that's not the, the educational track I started with, and I wound up getting a degree in, in economics. Um, Everything I've learned about machining, I've learned since in the last 15 years as a wood turner, uh, trying to repair my own stuff. And as I've been working with Hal here, uh, help, helping Ron as best I can, trying to keep the equipment we've got here uh, running a little bit. And I've, I've learned a lot, a lot about, about lathes and, and how they work. So let's start with the very beginning. Uh, you're going to hear some people, when they talk about, the, the, one of the first things that I do in the morning when I'm turning is I clean my lathe bed. Now, I don't have an air compressor. An air compressor is a really nice thing. See if you can get a close-up of this dust right here. With a, with a number of lathes with sliding headstocks, such as the Powermatic, you have the potential for picking up dust like this, going over on top of it, and you can cause some vibration when you turn larger objects. This is something that very skilled turners like Mike Mahoney and, and uh, Stuart Batty have pointed out. I've heard them say it more than once at, at symposiums. Maybe it's like my son's a musician, and he'll pay a lot of money for some fancy uh, earphones so he can hear perfectly. And me, I'm not a musician. I don't hear as well as he, do, he does. And, and kind of like Mike Mahoney and Stuart Batty, I probably don't have that same feeling because I'm not turning eight hours a day and haven't turned 15 million bowls, so I probably can't feel it as much. It's never happened to me that I've noticed, but it, it's a real thing. And it happens when you get dust like this and you decide to move the headstock uh, forward and it starts getting trapped under there and it doesn't take but just a little bit that you don't have that finely machined, uh, two, finely machined surfaces with full contact, and you can you can pick up some some vibration. So if you have a air compressor, it's nice. When you do, you can blow things off like that. I don't have an air compressor. Uh, a big one like that runs all the time. But even in a small shop without an air compressor, you can use a bench brush, and and get the leading surfaces everywhere in the front and the back, and just kind of knock off the dust. Now, depending on who you talk to, you're going to find some wood turners that uh, I get my, my guidance on this from John Jordan. He's been turning a long time, and he says first thing he does in the morning is he hits his lays, lay the bed with a little WD-40. And I thought, well, if it's good enough for John, it's good enough for me. And it doesn't have to be real fancy, real long. Just wipe it down. Now, I know there's somebody out there that's going to say, yeah, but WD-40 is not a lubricant. Well, I'm not going to argue with anybody that says whether it's a lubricant or not. That's not the issue. The issue is John Jordan says if you, if you put it on your lathe bed first thing in the morning, everything will just slip and slide real easily. Now, will it attract dust? Some people says it will. So, you know, you've got to pick your experts and say who you're going to listen to. One of the things that John talks about is not only do you clean the, the, the bed, when you're doing it, wipe off the, surf the, the, the front surface of your spindle. That's the area that's going to mate against the back of your, your chuck. By doing that, you'll dramatically reduce the opportunities of a stuck chuck. Yeah, Ron. T9. Uh, T9. 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 It, it penetrates the metal better. Yeah. Last yeah. Uh, so what he's talking about is Bow Shield. This was a product developed by Boeing, uh, primarily I think to spray and to reduce um, 
water getting into electrical fixtures in, air, in aircraft, and they found out it had a lot of other uses. I use Bose Shield very occasionally. I've had this can for 15 years. I don't know if you can hear it rattling. I don't use it a lot. If you have a, uh, if you've got a shop in Florida that's unair conditioned, then I'd probably get a lot more use out of this. My shop's air conditioned. I don't need to, it's not important for me to really seal the thing because it's not gonna rust in, in my shop. But if I was gonna leave it unair conditioned or you had an unair conditioned shop, this is a great product. It ha it's, it, it's a waterproof lubrication, works great. And you can put it on as thick as you want. Works on cat, it, it's great on cast iron. Not only does it work on lathe beds, it also works great on your uh, table saw. It works great on your bandsaw bed. Question. Yeah. Um, I do have a shop that's not climate controlled, so uh, moisture is a huge problem for me. And so I have gotten a little rust on on mine. What's the best way to get that off? Is it like well, usually a little rust is probably not going to really hurt anything. Some people says if anything, it gives you a better, better locking surface. But if you've got a you know big banjo or a powermatic, you you want it to, to be able to slip and slide fairly easily. I would say uh, there's lots of different ways to do it. Um, some people say get a, a little bit of, of sandpaper and put it on a block piece of felt or something that gives it a, a fairly flat surface and just clean it off with, with that fine grit. You could use steel wool, but I wouldn't use steel wool unless you have to because you got little bits of steel wool that's going to be here or there that might get in areas, theoretically. Maybe it's not a real problem, but that would, I would probably not do that, but it would work. These things are cheap, these, these uh, non-woven scuff pads. You can get it at a dollar, dollar store, several of them. So you could just spray this with, you know, a solvent, a WD-40, almost anything, and just, just rub it. If that doesn't work, heck, you can use a palm sander if it's really bad. And then once you get it cleaned up, then start taking care of it, like Ron suggests. You use some type, something like, like T9, but it doesn't have to be T9. You can use any kind of wax. Heck, a lot of people just use plain, old ordinary uh, furniture wax and a can of finishing wax like this will last you a lifetime. I don't know how long we had this in the family before it wound up in my shop. And it's still got a lot of wax in it. John? Scoop up the shop back, put a little brush on it, and it's got a thing on the, on the shop back that you plug in and it blows the things off. And then you turn it around and it sucks it off. At Eagle Ranch, we use just paste wax at the end of the, between the end of the summer session and the fall session where we, we're not there for three months. That's we perfect. We use wax, rub it on the surfaces, and, and that works fine. Yeah, and how much you, how thick a coat is going to be a function of how long it's going to be before you're going to get back to it. Um, because if it's too thick, you know, it's, you, you've probably got to go back and clean it off a little bit, maybe with some mineral, mineral spirits. I know everybody's in here that's ordered some piece of heavy equipment has probably got it in with what they call cosmoline, you get some kind of heavy crap on it so it won't rust all the way over from China or other parts of, of the world. And, and you gotta get rid of all that stuff and clean it off. And little mineral spirits will clean off any type of, uh, of, of wax. Uh, so it, it all works. Hey, Mike, so, yeah. Um, I, like Carolyn, have had issues with rust on the way to my lathe. Uh, wet wood, you well, you raise a good point. The trick is when you, if you're doing wet wood, that it, that's a different situation. Even in my shop, it tends to be woods with tannins. Cherry is kind of bad. Oak is is one of the worst. When you're going to turn those green, you want to put something on your lathe bed uh, before you turn, and then periodically knock off the shavings and don't let them sit on your bandsaw. Uh, table or you know if they get thrown around your shop don't let them sit on any of those surfaces because they will stain it most of the time it's it's a stain it it's not a big issue but you don't want to let it sit overnight because you know rusting uh, starts some people use uh, micro crystalline wax you know that renaissance wax that cost you an arm and leg in a tiny little can um, some people use use that um, I was cautioned about using Cast is, is a soft metal, and you yeah. can actually 
You gotta be careful if you get too aggressive. I, I, I think, you, again, you gotta listen, to, you gotta choose your experts, and some things are more theoretical than they are real. Um, I know I was a little upset when our lathe came back one time because it had gone to the sim one of the symposiums back when the when we provided it, and they they took palm sander and just really worked it over, and it's like that's not how I would want to take care of my lathe. But if you got a lot of rust, be real careful. Do you want to go in there and grind on your your lathe bed every time you turn around? No, I don't think so. You you shouldn't have to. But the key is having a flat surface keeping it flat and doing it carefully and using some, some common sense. Uh, so that's so much for lubricating. The other thing that's a, a pretty basic issue, and if you read any Chuck manual, they'll always say, you know, check your electrical power cords for any kind of problem. And we go, oh yeah, what? how often do you gotta do that? <laughs> <laughs> you know, maybe sometime you do, because that is a fire hazard. Now, so what should we do with this? We probably ought to clip this and have somebody with some electrical skills re rewire it because we got, you know, plenty of extra cord because that's getting to be a, a problem, <laughs> I think. Mike? Yeah. Uh, I just talked about a guy who had uh, replaced his frequency drive on the back mm -hmm. and it got a bad load. New in the block had a bad load. Bought one more, put it on, same bad load. The wire had a fray in it, and it was causing a problem. So it wasn't the frequency drive, it was the wire. Wow. So repairing the wire, you know, checking it, it's, it's more than just, doesn't look good or, you know. Yeah. yeah it, it could be causing serious problems. Yeah, and when it comes to electrical, um, if, if you, you know, a lot of lays, like that big Jet six, uh, 30, um, 1642 back there, is a, is a 110, uh, lathe, and it, it's a fine lathe. You could also get that model, similar to the Laguna, I think, that John's got. You can get it in either one and a half horsepower, 110, or, or a, a two horsepower, uh, two, 220. Uh, you you want to make sure you've got good electrical to your shop. So if you don't know how to wire it, you want to make sure you got somebody that does. They don't like ground fault interrupters. They don't, they don't like to be connected to a circuit like that. And from what I understand, I've, I've read online, I haven't personally experienced, but I've read online, where even uh, if you've got a uh, power box, whatever you call it, a you know, power supply, uh, where all your, all your wires run into, that some of those nowadays have individual ground fault interrupter, whatever you, circuit, break, circuit, circuit breakers, thank you. Uh, and sometimes, some lathes don't like those. They'll, they'll, they'll shut off. So kind of keep that in mind. If you're upgrading to a, to a 220 lathe, be aware of, of what the electrical requirements are. And in terms of electrical requirements, not exactly maintenance, but this is generally the plug that most people are going to use for a, a 220 lathe. It's got, I think it's called a NEMA 15. It's for a, a 20 amp circuit and 20 amps is plenty big enough, at least for a two horsepower. I can't speak to a three horsepower robust, but uh, I think if you look at the motor here, uh, the amps are 6.2. So even on a full load when it's starting up or something, or even if you're coring, you know, 20 amps is plenty uh, big enough and that, that would be the, the kind of plug. And the reason I comment on that is I saw somebody that, that bought an older lathe from Bob Black, and I went in his shop, and he had the he had these 30 amp, had a 30 amp plug, the kind you'd have on a dryer, and I know those things are a whole lot more expensive than this, and especially if he paid to have a 30 amp circuit run because it was just way way overkill uh, on on the expense of, of doing it. Uh, so this is lubricant. There's another product besides Bow Shield I haven't used, but you know it's somewhat similar, it's called top coat. Some people recommend that. So there's, there's more than one. The, the spray aspect makes it fairly convenient where the, the uh, paste wax, you know, a little more effort maybe to pop the lid off, rub it on, let it dry a little bit. If you wait too long, you've got to really get in there and, and buff it because it can get, get too heavy. When you are wiping it down, I did the lathe bed. What I also do at home, 
typically is I pull my banjo, and I've got a 3520 also. I pull my banjo back, and I just rub the, the bottom of it like this to clean the, total, the, the bottom. Then I push it forward and clean, make sure I get the, the back side of it. And as a result, then I can just, you know, swing the thing around. And for the new one, this is, this is the, uh, the A model. I now have the C model. The C model banjo, and this is a heavy banjo for anybody who's turned on this thing, weighs 10 pounds more than this one does. I mean, it's, it's crazy. And if you don't have a slick bed, you know, if you don't have that thing working, it's, it's an effort to move that, move that thing around. Bear with me as I kind of go through my checklist. Another question. Um, yes. Yeah, that's a, that's a good good point, Carolyn. We want to take advantage with the few times. Whoops, that wasn't a good move. But this thing's a cheap Chinese. Uh, <laughs> it, was, uh, it needs a little maintenance. <laughs> yeah. But you do want to clean off the bottom. We can see a little bit of rust here. And, and when you're, if you're working on a workshop here and you got somebody in and you're turning a lot of green bowls, it's the last person out before you turn off the lights, clean it off and put that wax on it. I've come in here on house after we've had workshops, and let me tell you, some of these lays are a mess with the, with the rust on them. There's a little bit of rust right there. So you want to you want to clean clean the uh, that surface off as well. While we're, while I've got this off, we want to talk a little bit about how these tailstocks mount. Generally, they're all uh, somewhat similar. They use a similar mechanism on the the banjo, and we'll look at that in a moment. It's got some type of concentric or eccentric. What do you call it? Eccentric uh, cam. Uh, uh, so when you move the the the, the lever, whether it's on, on the back side, like, like, you know, the little jet that goes this way, or whether it's going this way, it pulls it up, and you've got a, got a clamp block. Well, you want to clean that surface off as well. So let's go ahead and take advantage of this being off and just kind of wipe it down a little bit. Probably with a little bow shield. Now, I have had people say, yeah, you don't, don't use WD-40, you ought to use silicon spray. Uh, the person that advocated that has a book out, very experienced wood turner. I think maybe they're a shop teacher. Personally, everything I've read about woodworking says don't, don't spray silicon anywhere in your shop because it has a tendency to cause problems with any kind of finish. So that would kind of scare me off of, of, of using, using silicon. Could be. Uh, I've got a different product. I don't want to drop this on my foot. Actually, I'll put this on the floor because we're going to turn that banjo over. Now, so let's talk about banjos a little bit. I never really had problem with a banjo, and then I started reading some forum where they started talking about it, and then I had to take mine apart and look at it, so hmm, never thought of that. So it's got that same kind of concentric design. We got a little bit of little rust here. Now normally, you don't want to lubricate these things, but again, you gotta pick your experts. Some people will say lubricate them. Other people say you don't lubricate them. I would say the expert that, that I listened to said you, when you get a new one, you want to clean it off. If you want to rub a very, very light coat of something and then wipe it down, that's probably okay. But you don't want to put grease on it. You don't want to put wax on it, I don't think, because it's not really, really necessary. But you do want it fairly, fairly clean. 
this surface you can see there's a little bit of rust. And this is probably a maintenance task that we ought to do periodically. We might do it in our shop, but I think our sometimes here we kind of take this stuff for granted and live with with problems because it's only going to be a short time thing and we don't worry about it. We just kind of let it go. Um, the other thing about banjos, they all have a very similar design. They got a big clamp block. So the issue is when do you tighten them? Now they, the design for these things, they have a, a big nut here that's got a nylon inside. I think they call them nylon uh, nuts. And they last a long, long time. Maybe, maybe your life, the life of the lathe, but, but you can, a strong person, I mean, John could take, take any kind of equipment, and if he pushed her beat on it long enough, you know, he could take it, take it to, the, to the, the extreme, maybe more so than I could, because I'm not as strong as John. But when you adjust one of these things, if it needs adjustment, you want to put this clamp block, might be square, might be round. Uh, I like the square ones because they slide easier. You want to put it in the center before you make that adjustment because that's going to be the e even between the, the two center, the, each, each end is where you want to make that adjustment. If you adjust it over here, that's not where most of the work is going to be or where, where this thing's going to be on the lathe. So you adjust it from the center position. Um, it probably doesn't hurt to put you know, a drop of machine oil right here and right here where the two parts uh, uh, rub. I doubt if anybody ever does that, but it's not a bad idea. Just don't get it going everywhere. Um, if I take that, that banjo off, and I think I will, we're going to see it has exactly the same design. I, got a, I did a video on banjos not too long ago when I started learning about some of this stuff on banjos. And I looked at three different ones, three different sizes, and they were all virtually looked the same design, just bi just bigger. Well, I'm gonna break something here in a minute. Uh, yeah, that's a good point, John. One way makes a great banjo. Um, and I was going to get, hold that thought for a second until I turn these things over. I'm going to clean it off. So this works the same way. It's got the nylon uh, block. And when it goes on here, again, adjusting it in the middle will give you the, the best tension. It... When this thing comes over just about even, that's just about the right tension. If it goes over too far, it needs a little little tightening. Uh, you might be perfectly happy with it not going over so far. Kind of depends on where it is and if you want to put any effort in it. But if it goes past 90 degrees, it, it needs an adjustment. So let's roll this thing back over. Yeah, it, I've seen a video on their design. The one way does have a really some really nice engineering. And price-wise, uh, the two companies that make great aftermarket banjos are one way and robust. I think I paid 229 for it, something like that. Yeah, it's probably a little more expensive now. Uh, but they have not gone up much in price compared to other machinery and inflation. The one-way banjos, because I priced it very carefully before I recently upgraded uh, a year ago uh, my uh, Powermatic to the to the newer model, because frankly I hate hated the the way this clamps onto the um, the tool post. Basically, you just turn this thing until you got a screw. Uh, I'm not real concerned about it putting a little divot in here. Frankly, I haven't seen much of that problem. Some people complained about it damaging the tools, the tool post, uh, having little divots. I didn't really see that. But when you start dealing with your, 
Let me find the, the long one. There it is. Yeah, because the snake in it bit me. So this is a big banjo, 14 inches. And the problem or, or, or an issue with it, when you get one this long, when you start working out here and bumping it, you, you got a long lever. It's just like, you know, like long hand, handle on a, on a hammer. And that, if all you've got that tension on it, it's just real hard to snug up. And I've seen a lot of professional demonstrators that will uh, do that. And then they'll take their, uh, their whatever tool they're using and they'll smack this thing uh, with their tool handle to, to tighten it. You know, I don't, I don't want to do that. Uh, you know, I just don't feel like it shouldn't be like that. So that was a factor that caused me to think about upgrading. And I looked very carefully at the one-way banjo, and that probably was the cheapest solution. And it would be a very good solution. And it's funny, for a 20-inch lathe, for this 20-inch this lathe, you buy a 16-inch banjo. And it's, it's, just, it's just really big. I'm, I'm, you probably got a 16-inch on, on your 18-inch. Yeah, it, it's just got a, it's got a clamp block in it, uh, and the Robust has that same type of action, the One Way has that kind of action, and the newest Powermatic has that kind of action, and, it, and they're just a, a joy, to, joy to work with. <laughs> so let's talk about these ratchet knobs a little bit, because they're very common. That's this kind of knob right here. I'm going to pass a couple around. Y'all may not be familiar with them. Uh, this is one that came off of the, the, the jets. Most of them are this size on the, 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 the ones that we've got. This, actually, this is, uh, that's a different size. But this one and that one and the one on the tailstock, uh, no, I guess it's just those two. The one on the motor, and this one, and there is one on the uh, there is one on the tailstock of the Jet 20. It's the one that goes in the little groove. Let's put the let me give me a hand with this tailstock. Put this thing back up there. This quill that slides in and out has a groove in it. And it varies on your lathe where that groove is. This model, the groove is on the bottom. So it's got a, a little pin up under here that fits in that, that groove that keeps it from turning. On the, can I bring a tailstock with me for that? Yeah, here we go. So on the tailstock for uh, the little, the jets we've got, whether it's a 1014 or a 10, 1015, the groove is on the side. And I don't know how many times I've seen people say, you know, I can't get this thing tight. <laughs> They'll be in here on a workshop. Well, the reason it's tight is because this thing's just spinning around. Because it needs this pin in it to keep it from untwisting because it's threaded on a, on a shaft. We'll take one of these loose in just a moment. Now, did I pass those? I didn't pass them out. So here's one. These are both the same size threads. These are, I think, 5 sixteenths by 18. These are the ones, uh, and I think on, this is the, the one that comes with it, that size. It's a little bit different size, but the same size thread on the motor, but it's got a little uh, bigger handle. You to go to buy this thing, I think it'd probably cost about $25. They say it's made out of zinc. You can go to Woodcraft, you can go to Peachtree Woodworking, you can go on Amazon. You can get one with a plastic handle with maybe plastic in insert, maybe metal insert on the inside. Little different shape, same size thread, and you can get them for, you know, maybe six bucks. Now, is this one better? I don't know. I don't think they last any longer because they all wear out here. When you get this many people coming in on workshops, grabbing and jerking and, and not 
not knowing what they're doing and, and twisting it too hard, eventually you wear out the, uh, the little teeth on the inside. I'll pass these, these out. The longer handle is not a big issue. Maybe it's not as pretty sticking up. Maybe this one's stripped. I think this one's already stripped. Uh, but if the handle is too long for you, you can always cut it off with a, with a saw and take a little sandpaper and polish it, polish it up a little bit. But the way these things work, there's a spring in them. You pull it out so you can change direction. You've also got one of these things typically on our one-way... Um, yes, the handle on the uh, platform on our one-way jig has that same style handle. You pull it out and turn it because you don't have enough clearance to go around in a circle or just have a knob on it. So that's why you got this, this, this ratchet. Um, if, the, if the thing ever comes loose, it goes flying apart, you lose the spring. Sometimes you can go to a uh, Ace Hardware store, can't find them at Lowe's, can't find them at, at Home Depot, but you can go to an Ace Hardware store and they'll have a spring uh, uh, selection area. You may be able to find a spring. You might have to work with it a little bit, cut it off, but a lot of times you can find that replacement part. Uh, back to headstocks. Let's talk about some headstock maintenance issues. I hear a lot of people, uh, I see a lot of uh, posts on various forums talk about wood turning and they'll, they'll say, my lathe is making noises, uh, do I need new bearings? <laughs> I don't know, but from, from what I've seen and what I've experienced, bearings don't generally wear out on a lathe. Can they? Yes. If you get a lathe in the 40s or 50s, you know, they probably maybe worn out or been replaced for? Yes. But your typical lathe, probably not so much, but maybe. Uh, it's more of an issue if you go to buy one, if you're buying a used piece of equipment, you certainly want to evaluate that to see if, if the bearings, you know, if you've got... Uh, play or slop or vibration uh, that might be the bearings. Bearings can be replaced. They're not terribly expensive, but it might be a challenge for somebody who's not a machinist, who's not an engineer, because it's, it, it, it does take some, some knowledge and, and confidence to tear a piece of equipment like this because these parts come out, they're finely machined, they got to go back together. Um, I would personally prefer not to have to change a, a, a bearing. Yeah, maybe, <laughs> or you have to tap them. It, it kind of depends on the lathe, I guess, how much uh, experience there is. Most lathes, most of the smaller lathes have two bearings, and, and the manual will tell you, you know, what the spec of the bearing is, so they're easy to buy. You look up the spec, see what it is, go online, go to Bearings RS, or us, go to a, a automotive store. You can get replacement bearings. They come in different qualities, but you got a bearing here and a bearing here. Now, with big lathes, and I say big, uh, certainly the Powermatic, certainly the big one-ways, certainly the big robust, they're going to tend to have three bearings. Does it have to have three bearings? Well, it depends for the kind of work I turn. Probably not, because I turn mostly smaller work. But if you're turning, the lathes are designed to handle the capacity that they're designed to handle. And if you're only turning 10 or 12-inch bowls, you know, two bearings is, is, is fine. You start moving up to a 20 inch where you could be putting a piece of wood on here this big, you know, might be way 50. What's the, big, what's the heaviest block you ever put on your lathe, John? It took me a while to get it up there, so it was, I, the hell, I, it was yeah. heavy. The heaviest one I ever turned, I think I've weighed it, it was like 55 pounds. It was more than I cared to lift. And, and John probably, his the one that he was lifting was probably a whole lot heavier than, than mine. So when you start getting something that big and it's out of balance and it's out of round, you want that, that, uh, that third, third bearing, and that's generally what's going to come on a, on a really big lathe. Um, so keep that, in, keep that in mind. One of the issues that, that I've seen maintenance-wise on a lathe is you can damage the threads. Um, I think these, these threads were damaged. You can fix them. Um, it can be as simple as using a, a, a triangular file. The instructions that I've seen, though, says take a file 
and you grind off one face. And the reason you do that is because that's going to be on the thread that you're not working on. So you got a smooth surface rubbing against it, and then you've, you've got the, uh, the part with teeth uh, cutting against that, removing that burr or that damaged area. Uh, so that's a, that's a thought. Uh, but it doesn't take a whole lot to clean up minor, minor damage. This is fairly mild steel. I'm not a steel expert, but this is not high-speed steel. This is, I don't think this is even tool steel. It's softer than that, and it can be damaged. Uh, it, especially if you do something kind of crazy, like, you know, if you don't know what you're doing and you think you watch a Richard Raffin uh, video where he slaps a, a bowl uh, blank on a, on a woodworm screw while the thing's turning, and then somebody says, oh, yeah, I could do that with my chuck. And they put the chuck on a spindle and they try to do that, and it's like, you know, it ain't going to be pretty. But there are people that, you know, you can't, what well, they say, you can't fix stupid. And the people will do some pretty, pretty, pretty crazy, pretty crazy things. <laughs> so that's something that if you've got burrs on. The other problem, and we've got a lathe back here like that. I don't know what someone did, but they damaged the face right here. And it's very important with machine parts like this that they register. And register means the two finely machined surfaces come together. So when this goes on, it can, it can feel pretty sloppy sometimes coming on there, uh, face, face plates especially. And that's okay, because once it registers, it ain't going nowhere, and they're perfectly parallel, and that, that's important. But if you damage a surface, and like I said, I don't know how in the world somebody did it, uh, then you've got, uh, again, a repair job. And if you don't know how to, if you're the one that caused the problem, you probably b better get somebody else to help you fix it. Is anybody using a dial knob and wash it when they put their chucks on? Mm -hmm. Nylon washers are one of those things that, yeah, again, you got to listen to your experts. Yes, it, it, it will keep your chuck from locking on. There's no question about that. It is not machined like these two surfaces and thousandths of an inch can make a difference. What made a believer, and I read this, and I thought, you know, how much difference could it make? Until I was visiting uh, a, a shop of a noted uh, Gwinnett woodworker where I did a video on, on chucking, and he had a washer, and I looked at that thing's like, oh my gosh. It was just completely mangled. And he was still using it. Um, so it was not gonna run true long before it ever got to the state that it was in. I would discourage somebody from using it because if you just use a little WD-40 when you clean the lathe bed and just wipe the surface and wipe that surface and get it clean, don't leave you know, a big coat of oil on it, just, just wipe it off. If nothing else, you've gotten the dust off of here and you got the dust off of here. And if dust under here can cause vibration, dust between these two surfaces can cause some, some vibration or cause the thing to get go on there uneven and tend to, to lock. Now, if you do get one locked, and it happens, I got a particular chuck that tends to lock a little bit, and it's a lot like this record, looks like this record power, except it's a Nova. I made this little tool for my Supernova 2, just a piece of uh, music wire, uh, high carbon steel. Uh, same thing I make awls out of. Just put it on a handle, put a ferrule on it. It goes right in this hole is, is, that's where your Allen wrench goes to tighten the uh, set screw that keeps the insert from coming loose. And it goes in there, and then I hold down the, uh, the spindle lock, and it'll pop, it'll pop loose without too much trouble. because it doesn't get real stuck. Now, what happens if you get one that's real stuck? I just did a video on that the other day. <laughs> There's a lots of things you can do. Well, pass these parts out. That's the rest of the spindle lock. 
They don't make those parts anymore for this lathe. Well, you have to talk to Alan Patterson. Yeah. They don't make those parts anymore. When this lathe was made, it was this cast iron or pot metal or whatever part of the spindle lock that, that they designed where, you know, you screwed it on and fastened it onto the spindle. Uh, maybe it happened with a lot of people sooner than we experienced it, but the next design, they turned that part as part of the spindle, so it's all one piece of metal. So you don't have that problem. But I looked that up, you can't get, get a replacement anymore. Uh, so here's how, if you get it stuck, you, d you need to have a way to, you know, lock it down. In this case, we can't use a spindle lock, but you can put a big wrench on it. I doubt if this thing is right size. This, this is designed to fit the um, face plate that comes with, with the Pyromatic. It's the most useless thing I've ever seen. I've never seen anybody use one. There's a lot of metal. Why they didn't make one, in this case, to fit on the spindle, it would seem to have made a lot more sense. Um, but you can take a, and actually the small one way, I think, Lauren, didn't that, didn't we see that on that, that one way that uh, uh, Welburn's would have had to, to lock it? You used a, a special locking bar, kind of like a wrench on the outside. You're in the wrench with it. I got the wrench. Yeah. You could. In this case, this is not not big enough, but on some on some. Uh, Some inserts. I wasn't using a pipe wrench. Yeah, I, a strap wrench. Oh. oh yeah, yeah. That's not. Yeah, that's that's a plumbing. Um, um, Dwight, you know what it's called? It's for underneath the sink, or it. it it's actually, it's not a basic wrench. It's called uh, something else. But anyway, it's a piece of crap. I mean, the tolerance of it. You can't ever get it tight. But it's usually good enough for what I use it for, you can adjust it to fit the outside of Technotool uh, inserts or, or face plates. It's, it's not a base, it's... Um, no. It's, it, it looks a little like this if it's real cheap. Yeah, it, 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 yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's not a real strong... <laughs> But anyway, if you get a wrench uh, big enough, you, you can clamp it on here, and then all you got to do is is bring your your tool post over for it to rest against. Uh, you know, so th that'll hold it. The trick is, you don't want to be futzing with it. You want to smack it once, real good, with a mallet out here somewhere. You don't want to be tapping on it. You want to hit it really hard one time and free it up. And it'll 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 free up when you when you have a long lever like this. A bar like this is ideal. If you don't have a bar like this, from however, I don't think so. I don't see how you could uh, because it's not going to take that much damage. And these things are fast down. Make sure you got the threads. I mean the screws. They're not loose. This one they're loose. They need tightening before I'd really do it on this one. But you know you got it. Uh, the, the forces are hitting on two different chucks. I, I don't think that would be a problem. It's not like you're going to take a sledgehammer and keep wailing on it. You're just going to snap it out here where you got that long lever arm. Now, I think the, when we were looking at doing this once before and we were looking for something to break it loose, somebody suggested using the, uh, knockout, the knockout bar. I said, well, you just use the knockout bar. Uh -oh. And that would probably work. You might bend it. You might bend it, and it's because it's round. You're not going to get quite as much tension on it. So I'd probably avoid doing this, except in an emergency. But you know, you got to do what you got to do. Uh, but instead of this kind of uh, strap, what I've used and what I tended to have at my lathe until I came up with this is a um, flat um, pry bar. You know, about that long. It'll do the same thing. Clamp it down, and it's, it'll stick out far enough. But smack it with a wood mallet, and it'll it'll come right loose.
if you're having to do that, you want to stop and evaluate to say, well, why did this happen? Is there any damage? Is there any burr? Can I see anything under, under strong light? Can I feel any damaged surface that got scratched here or here? Um, I only have one chuck that sticks, and I got about seven chucks. That leads me to believe that I've got one chuck that I need to look at a little more carefully and, and, and take some fine grit sandpaper, put it on a piece of MDF where it's got a nice smooth surface, and just rub it very carefully, very evenly flat uh, a little bit until I resolve that problem. One of the problems um, that I've seen people when they, when they use a really big block of wood, typically you're gonna do that on a face plate, plate right? The challenge is you get that 50 or 60 pound block up here and you're straining to get it up here and now you're trying to thread it onto a chuck, I mean onto the, the spindle. Yeah. It's real easy to cross thread this thing and if you cross thread it and just move it a little bit, this soft metal, you're gonna, you're gonna damage the threads. So you gotta be very, very careful. So maybe you need an assistant or Something that, that I advocate is these faceplate rings. Most chucks, you can get one. We've got one, and it's, and it's interesting. This is called a four-inch four faceplate ring. Does that look like four inches to you? That's a five-inch ring. The company has it, sells it as a five-inch ring. It's in their catalog as a five-inch ring but they couldn't tell the person that's printing the boxes to put five inches on it. Go figure. But anyway, the beauty of these things, this one's never been used because it's still got the Cosmoline on it. The beauty of this is when you have it on there, you have the chuck on here, and you just lift that thing on and just slide it onto the jaws, and all of a sudden, it's carrying the load. And then all you got to do is take your chuck wrench and, and tighten it up and you won't run that risk. So I mean these, first time I saw these I thought, boy that seemed like an awfully expensive gimmick, but, but it wasn't, it didn't solve a problem that I had, but when I got to looking at it and, and was, was given a couple of these things, I thought, well there is a purpose for it, and to me that's the real benefit of these, these things, is for really large blocks, mounting it on the lathe to prevent, uh, prevent damage. Yeah, they got a four inch, they have a four inch, and then they have the five inch. Uh, I've never had much of a problem finding anything on Amazon, but or Craft Supply. Between Craft Supply and Amazon, I, I found everything. All right, the next thing, Morse tapers. Everybody knows what a Morse taper is. That's this very finely uh, machined surface. Uh, they they come different sizes, typically. Old, old cheap lathes like old craftsman, shopsmith, whatever, they tended to have a Morse taper one. All modern lathes, and I say all, yeah, somebody probably proved me wrong. I've never seen one that didn't have a number two Morse taper that's made in the last, I don't know, say 20, 20 years. Number two Morse taper here, the one exception, and it's a Morse taper uh, two on the tailstock. Every mini lathe I've seen, Midi lathe, mini lathe, made, made in recent history, all got a number two. Whether it's a big lathe or a small lathe. The one exception is on the, the large, on the one-way lathes, they use a number three Morse taper. And the reason that's important is you need to know if you're gonna start swapping out accessories, you may need to have an adapter or make sure you got number, buy number three accessories that you're gonna use in the tailstock. You wanna clean this thing as a minimum. No matter when I, if, when I go to put a, a, a device in here, I always stick my finger in it and just do that. Make sure it's somewhat clean. Is it clean? No. Usually that's gonna be good enough. I visited a fellow one time to help him out making a handle and we put a, I put a, a drill chuck in there and no matter what we did, that thing was just rattling around. It's like, what is going on here? And I took it out and I just stuck my finger in there. And it's like, whoa, something biting me in there. He had damaged, galled the inside with a metal. It just kind of ripped little shreds loose. And I, let's see if I brought, that's a, uh, oh, I forgot to, forgot to bring it with me. 
um, th that requires some, some repair to get rid of those things. You can buy these reamers that, you know, shaped a little bit like a, a Morse taper, but it's got these really sharp machined cutting edges on it. There's a coarse one and a fine one, and you machine it. We're not going to get into details on how you repair damage, but they have tools to do it. But again, if you cause that damage, you better get somebody that knows more about machinery than you do to fix it. Joe? If you use a reamer, you have to be very careful because on the taper, if you go 10 thousandths bigger, it's a quarter inch of depth. So all of a sudden, that more taper insert is going to go all the way in. Yeah. You won't be able, it won't do anything because yeah. you'll lose it. So yeah. you got to remember that taking a 10 thousandths off is a quarter inch of movement. <laughs> on that paper going back and forth. So you can read it out, you gotta realize yeah. very little reading can mean get a machinist to help you. If you've damaged it, get somebody who knows what they're doing to help you fix it. They're not real expensive. I bought some cheap Chinese ones, never had to use them. Uh, but but helping that one guy was a real eye opener to me that how you could damage it. They how do they get damaged? They get damaged because someone didn't clean the, the Morse taper off before they stuck it in there. They took something like this, got dust all over it, they crammed it in there. And you, and you don't have those two finely machined surfaces. So as a minimum, you know, you know, at least, you know, clean the thing off as best you can. But even better is use some type of, of uh, taper uh, cleaner. This is a bore brush. Um, I bought one for the club. I got to put a handle on it. Just pass that around. It's just a it's just a shotgun bore brush. I don't know anything about shotguns. I read it somewhere what size, and then I ordered one. But it goes in there. This is bronze. It's not going to damage the thing. It's not like you're in there scrubbing on this thing all day long. But that will get rid of anything that's embedded in there. While you're at it, you probably ought to hit the, the tailstock. Although the tailstock is generally not as much of a problem because once that taper in there, it's not getting quite the same strain. The strain is all on, on this moving moving part. This one's not quite as much because you get that live, live center on there, but you still want to keep it clean. They used to sell one out of plastic called a green weenie. Uh, you can't, they don't sell them anymore, uh, but that's another way to, to clean them. I suppose it could. Um, I, I, I doubt it. I don't know, you got any thoughts on that? Can you damage the Morse taper with a knockout bar from the backside? Yeah. Uh, I, I guess you would have to really do something kind of crazy, seems like. Like bring it in there sideways and him. <laughs> I don't know. But normally you, you kind of fit the thing in there. At least I do. Um, the other way that those things get damaged is you've got a part in there and it gets loose. And the, and the part you typically have is, is something like a, a, a drill, uh, a, a Jacob's chuck. And so you got a Jacob's chuck, or in this case, this is a, more, uh, this is a Beale uh, buff adapter. And you just pop it in there. I mean, that's how they fit. You, you give it a pop. Some people even advocate, not, again, I'm not a machinist, they advocate just tapping it a little bit. How many of y'all got drill presses? Most of those uh, chucks are mounted with a Morse taper that's been tapped in there. <laughs> How often do they come loose? I've seen them come loose, but it's kind of rare. Once they're tapped in there, you know, they, they're, they're pretty much in there. But if you start getting lateral strain on here and this thing wasn't clean, you can have this thing rattling around and start causing damage. Uh, if you're not careful and you're putting on it, uh, some lateral pressure on it and it wasn't clean and this thing starts vibrating loose, you have a problem. That's why you use a, a draw bar. Now, we talk about damaging the inside. You can see on this one, I've got a little rubber O-ring kind of thing. Anybody got any veterinarians in here? Can identify what this is? I got this idea from uh, Lyle Jamison. He uses it to, to turn on his uh, laser designator for his hollowing system. Uh, they're castration rings <laughs> for, for animals. So, you know, you just thread that thing on there. This, this has got a different size and shape than mine, so it's got a different bar. Uh, you, you make you a knockout bar for 
whatever your part requires. This one requires a quarter inch by 20. Uh, I have a collet chuck. You can buy these 3 8 inch collet chucks that are pretty handy for some things. If you, if you buy a threading jig, you tend to use a 3 8 inch collet chuck to hold a cutter. And the cheapest way uh, for those is it uses a five, I think a 5 16 inch coarse rod. You make your own. It's not a, not a big deal. But you definitely, if you're putting something in here like a drill chuck or one of these things, you definitely want to have a, uh, a draw bar. Now the other possibility, you know, if this is, you know, a bill buff, this is a 3 8 inch. Um, the other solution, instead of, you know, using, using that thing, you know, I just use a wooden block. It's been tapped. It doesn't even have a metal tap on it. And I find this easier because it doesn't need a draw bar. So it's just faster and easier. And this will work just fine. You know, I just tapped, tapped the wood. Well, if you're going to tap the wood, though, you don't use spindle orientation. Woo! Spindle orientation grain. You use cross grain. Compressed air, Morse tape. The other way to clean Morse taper, if, you, if you've got compressed air, Every time you get an opportunity, of course, take advantage of your compressed air. Do you see stuff spraying out the end? Yeah. <laughs> It'll happen. If you don't have a, a, a bronze bore brush cleaner, and I pass the thing around so you can write down what size it is, you can order one. There, there's like th less than three dollars on Amazon. So, yeah, it's 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 cheap. Um, you can always. Use a small dowel, wrap it with a, with a piece of uh, kitchen paper or paper towel, and clean the inside. But do clean it out. Okay, uh, going back to this one, we talked about the quills here going in and out. How many of y'all have a tailstock where this thing has gotten to the point where it's just real hard to retract and go in and out? You know, I, I can remember the first time I was trying to get you know, a self-ejecting uh, live center out of my fairly new Powermatic, uh, my, my first one. And, and I was afraid to turn this thing as hard as, as I could turn it. And this one's got a plastic handle. That, 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 that B model had this nice chrome handle and a chrome bar. And, and so I called the, uh, the company that, that sold it to me, a real nice fellow, uh, uh, the son of Rudy Asolnik. Some of y'all uh, heard of Rudy, passed away several years ago. And he said, uh, just, just pull it back as far as it'll go until you, you, know, you can't get to retract anymore, and then just smack on it with a mallet. And I said, well, won't it break it? He says, it's under warranty. <laughs> <laughs> but it turns out it didn't take, all I had to do was have the confidence to kind of hit it some, but you don't want to hit things with your hand because you can hurt your hand, but it didn't take a whole lot to, 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 to break it loose. So we keep cranking this thing. Now this has got regular threads. The newer one has got Acme threads. Acme threads are much nicer in that they are coarser, they're square, they're stronger, and where this takes 17, 16 or 17 turns per inch of projection, that Acme thread takes about six. So it doesn't take nearly as long to crank that thing in and out. So you've got this keyway here that this screw fits in, whether it comes in from the top or here, comes in the, the back of, of the Pyromatic B model. Uh, it goes in on the top of the um, uh, record power coronet we've got back there, goes in on the side here. But it's, it's got some way to keep this thing from spinning. The problem is, is when you get a lot of coarse action on here, um, especially if you have a drill in here and you do a lot of drilling for hollow forms where it just gets a lot of, of, of strain, you wind up rubbing a small fine burr along here. And you can't even feel it. The first time I went out to help that same fellow that had the galled Morse taper, and, and this was his second, he was about to, thinking he was going to have to order a second quill because he'd already damaged one before. And I'm, I'm helping him. Uh, I'm looking at the thing, and I don't know what's wrong with it, but it, you know, it's hard to turn it in and out. And I looked at it, and I measured it, and I just, it took me a long time to figure out what was going on. 
This is very finely machined in here, even though it's cast iron. I mean, it's very close tolerance for this thing. It's just not a lot of, a lot of play or, or slop. And then it finally dawned on me, there was this tiny little burr that got raised up. And all, all you have to do is take a, a very fine file to get rid of that burr or some very fine sandpaper, again, on a flat, flat board. And then maybe, uh, I didn't bring a, a hone with me, maybe you just chamfer that edge just a little bit on the edge where this, it, it's rubbing on the, on the keyway to reduce the chances of that, uh, that thing uh, raising a, a burr again. Uh, now, how do you lubricate this? Um, some people don't lubricate it. Somebody says, well, maybe you, you might want to use a dry lube. I think probably a dry lube is, is fine. Is that like graphite or something? Uh, this yeah. is, this particular one, I can't see exactly what it is, but it, it goes in with a, a, some type of moisture or solvent that you know, evaporates like that and it leaves this very, very fine, thin uh, coating. So you just put this thing back in there and hopefully we'll get it back. Oh, and this one, you got to put it in the right direction. And once you, once you do that little bit of maintenance, you know, you're, you're good to go. And every one of them I've seen, they're all basically the same. With the exception of that car, record Carnet Herald, which I thought was kind of funny when somebody pointed out to me, it does not have a self-extracting tailstock. I'd never seen that before, and I'm thinking, are you kidding me? They saved a nickel by just having one part instead of two parts. And we got it before they started selling them in the United States, and I gave feedback to, to them, and I guess uh, when they sold a few of them, they got a lot of feedback real quick. <laughs> and they sent uh, replacement tail stocks to everybody that got the, new, the first model because people in the United States weren't going to put up with that. No modern lathe made in the last, I don't know, 20 plus years doesn't have a self-extracting headstock. You have to knock out your live center with a knockout bar. Just goofy, you know. But they saved a nickel, but it cost them. What? Oh, really? Eh. Maybe the Galaxy, but the Saturn and sixteen point six, whatever, it doesn't have an extracting. Uh, VFDs. Um, we talked about this a little bit. These things um, on this model, you plug it in and it stays on all the time. Um, I'm not sure that it's a good idea in this area if you've got a lot of thunderstorms coming through. If you could remember, it's probably a good idea to unplug your lathe. We unplug this lathe every time we close up your shop, always. Uh, that said, I, for, I forgot to unplug it an awful lot of times, and I had my Pyromatic for 14 years and never had a lightning strike that took out the VFD, but it, it can happen. Uh, some, the, the, I turned on a... Uh, robust American Beauty, and it had a lockout switch that turned off the circuit to the lathe, so the VFD shut down. And I thought, wow, that's kind of a nice feature. It was a lot easier to flip that electrical switch than it was to go over to the wall and unplug uh, plug the power cord. And then, lo and behold, when they came out with the, the newest version of the Powermatic, they have a lockout electrical cutoff. It completely separ separates the uh, the circuit and shuts down the, the VFD. That's why on the older ones, you should always unplug it because they stay on all the time. Yeah. Yep. And they get heated up, and that's why people have to keep replacing So I, yeah. I've got a circuit breaker. I just hit the breaker. Yeah, yeah. yeah. that'd that work too. That, that's yeah. me, that'd be a lot of trouble to have to go over to a circuit the box. On the wall, the plugs okay. <laughs> what I did, Mike, was drop a power cord from the ceiling um, and put the female connector on there. Yeah. yeah. So when I plug my lathe in, it's just at eye level. It's over yeah. to the left, and it's very easy to just reach up and unplug it there yeah. rather than trying to go behind it and find Right, it. yeah. But that's, that was in a basement with an open-floor system where I could run that circuit up there. 
Yeah. Lots of different solutions. It, it's good to find one that makes it easy. And just recognize you probably don't want to have the thing plugged in all the time because it does run run the risk of damaging. But these can be replaced. Um, they, there's there's third party ones besides the Delta one um, that you can get on the market, and you can get used ones. There's a lot of equipment that use variable frequency drives, and they've even got some specialty companies that specialize repairing them, so it's possible you could even get one, one repaired. Uh, belts, let's talk a little bit about belts. Uh, these bigger lays and some of the nice smaller lays have these, uh, what do you call them, micro, you know, it's got the little grooves in them. So it matches it, it matches the, the pulley like, like this. So it, it, it's a really nice uh, tension. Uh, the bigger lathes, they tend to have two pulley changes, a high torque and a low torque, or spindle work and bowl work. Um, although there was one guy on, on one of the forums that had a jet uh, 1642 like that one in the back said, it was a surprise to him to find out that it actually had two speeds. He'd, uh, he'd never changed the speeds or the pulley. Didn't even know you could change the go to a different torque, but all he turned was bowls. Um, and then I can remember there was a, a, a very experienced production wood turner at one of the symposiums turning on a Powermatic, and I guess he turned on a Robust or a One Way at Home. And he had he was doing doing a, sp uh, a stool, uh, doing a spindle turning, and the fastest that lathe would turn was about 1400 when you had it in bowl mode. And it's very noisy. I mean, it makes a lot more noise because you're running it as fast as it'll go to get to that max speed, in this case, uh, 1,200. And if you're doing a spindle, you know, you, you want to get that thing up to 18 or 2,000 or something a whole lot faster. And you couldn't hardly hear what he was saying over the noise of that thing. And I thought, well, that's interesting. He's a professional wood turner, and he didn't even realize he could change the pulley. Or the, I don't know. People don't know what they don't know. <laughs> okay. The problem we have around here, <laughs> the problem we have here with these little lays is because they don't have a variable frequency drive on it, a little potentiometer, you have to change the speed with, with the changing the pulleys. And there's six different, six pulleys, and it's a little bit of an effort. And if the thing is, you know, how many of y'all have struggled with changing the belt speed on one of these, these little lays in here? I mean, you know what I'm talking about. They're, it's really tight, and you've got to get them lined up because when you start getting six of them, different sizes, you know, however, however that many is, and then you got them going in this direction on the on the bottom with something different, and you got to get them exactly lined up. If you don't get them exactly lined up, you're going to have the thing too tight, it puts a lot of strain on the belt, and you're gonna have a tendency to shred that belt over a period of time. The other thing, if you don't have it exactly fitting in those little grooves, you have it hanging off just a little bit, you're gonna have a tendency to shred the belt. Every now and then, I'll get kind of careless swapping my belt out, and I'll be turning and turning the thing on, and, and I'm hearing this little funny little sound, and it's like, what is this? And it finally dawned on me, I was off one, one of those little little places on there, just a little bit, and it was enough to make a, a, a strange kind of sound. Probably not enough to cause a problem, but you got to investigate strange sounds. Oh, banjo screeching. I didn't deal with this when it was over. Uh, for, for some people, and especially with, it tends to occur with a new, a new banjo, the banjo screeches when you move it along the bedway. Sometimes you can lubricate or clean the bedway, and it still screeches. So how do you deal with that? You've got to clean off uh, or, or take a file or, again, that fine sandpaper, and you need to get just, just caress that outside edge on both sides and that inside edge because there's, there's something a little bit proud, and it doesn't have to be, but just a little tiny little, not even a burr, but just a slightly different height in the casting that it's causing it to rub. And it's easy to fix. So if it's screeching 
recognize that you can clean that edge off just a little bit. Maybe use a diamond or CBN hone, but if it's screeching and it's bothering you, chances are you can fix it. That's an excellent question. Um, if you've got a uh, nice, robust tool rest, these are really nice, and Robust sells a ton of them uh, because I think they, you know, Steve Center sells a, a lot of nice ones too, but other Robust probably got the biggest market. Even Axminster, if any of y'all watch uh, Colwyn Way on his YouTube channel for Axminster, they, the Axminster in Great Britain sells Robust. Uh, tool rests. It's got a hardened steel rod, so generally they they don't need much, don't need maintenance. Maybe you can you ding one up. You probably can, but everyone I've I've felt seems to be nice and smooth. But if you've got you know something that's just some cold roll steel or cast iron, especially cast iron, you can definitely damage damage this thing if you get a really bad catch. And if you have poorly prepared tools, and I'm going to rail on, on, uh, on, on Sorby, uh, their, their skews. Sorry, they just haven't. They they might as well come out of Harbor Freight. They've got really sharp edges. You know, it's just a bar of steel. I mean, it's almost, you know, it's a bar of steel except all these four edges are just, you know, they'll almost cut you. Well, when you're coming in like this, doing a planing cut, and you get a catch or a, or a skate back, you know, you can get a dig in on this, on this cast iron. I mean, it, it happens. And it can happen when you're turning a bowl. How many of y'all got a bad catch with a bowl? <laughs> even, a round, even a round gouge can, 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 can uh, put a little ding on your tool rest if you get a bad enough catch. So how do you deal with it? You use a draw file and just, just work it. And you don't just work it on the top like this, because if you do that, you're gonna have a very sharp edge right here. You can accidentally cut yourself. So you wanna kinda, kinda get all of it. Make sure you get the edges, not just the middle, or pretty soon, you know, it'll, it can have a tendency to kinda get bowed in the middle. You can also do this on a big uh, belt sander. If you've got a big belt sander, you can do it real, real quick, maneuver it around on a, on a belt sander. Uh, you can also dress it with a, with a piece of uh, sandpaper, you know, 180 grit, 240 grit, wrap it on a, on a board, don't even use, wrap it on a board, just, and just kind of clean it up. Anytime you're using, moving a tool, sliding along here, especially like a skew where you're taking a planing cut, or in, in my case where I do some thread chasing, you really want that tool to slide on there very easily. And if you've got those little dings or burrs and, and, and rough spots, this needs a little work, um, you know, you, you, you're gonna get that little bit of a hesitation and you get that little bit of hesitation and you're gonna get your damage on, on the tool. So once you uh, hit it with a file, hit it with some sandpaper, and then I always keep a, a candle. You know, I keep it right here on, on the wall. I just kind of hit it a couple of licks with a candle. And it kind of tends to fill in the little tiny holes, uh, tiny dings, the tiniest ones, as well as just give you some minor, minor lubrication. Right. Good Looks question. Like Jack Moore showed me. Uh, just around one of the, the edges of the skew. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that is, it's kind of like a gouge slide. Exactly. And if it's a quality tool, you shouldn't have to do that. That's the point. If you look at any quali if you look at a quality skew, the edges are have been smooth. They've, they're arrased on the top and rounded on the bottom. Arrased means just the edge is just broken. Just a little I mean it's just round, but it's not really round. It's just kind of no sharp edge. The bottom is a little more rounded because typically you you do most of your, your planing cuts with the skew in the same orientation, although you could do it either either direction. Joe? It's becoming more of an issue, too, because cast iron hasn't gotten, gotten harder, but all the time tools <laughs> have gotten a lot harder. Yeah, that's, that's, a good good that's a good point. That's a good point. If you have a sharp edge on a powdered metal tool, yeah. it, I mean, it can cut 
Yeah. High speed steel versus cast iron, you know, the high speed steel is going to win every time. Just like wood versus tool, the, you know, the wood's going to going to lose every time. Unless you use a spindle roughing couch on a bowl. <laughs> Can we talk about the tool rest a little bit more? Yep. Yeah. What do you mean? <laughs> In other words, you can't get it as low as you would like sometimes. Yeah. Yes. Un unfortunately, some of those is is just bad design. <laughs> and you can you, you can you can you can look at a getting a different tool rest. <laughs> this is a good well, that's that's a good point too, because this is a one inch. Um, I can re Jack Jack Morris helped me make some tool rests, and he said, "Well, go buy some cold roll steel, one inch, and bring it over, and I'll help you uh, make some tool rests." And I did that, and just before he was ready to start welding the thing together, it's like, uh, Jack, let me just check something real quick. <laughs> and I took that bar in to make sure it would fit in that that post on his power mat, and guess what? Yeah. It was a few microns off. How far? I don't, not much. Enough where we had to put that bar on his metal lathe and, and, and use a, uh, a file to take it down a little bit and run back and forth a couple of times to get it, you know, not too small, but just, you know, uh, Goldilocks uh, uh, just right. But this one, you can see from the design, this is fairly... Yeah, that's what I <laughs> Yeah. Um, Robust. So both of these got one inch post, but look at the difference in where the stop is. Yeah, it's where the stop is. Yeah. That's the problem. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you for asking that, that question. That's a, that was a good one. Uh, lathe leveling. Um, some lathes, uh, a lot of them come with uh, leveling legs. The issue is if it's not level, it'll vibrate. And you've got to get rid of that vibration. And it, you know, I got a video on that. We're not going to go into a lot of detail, but it's not a three legged stool, it's a four legged stool. And that means one of those legs has got to be adjusted and you got to play with it a little bit. And you can feel the vibration and you can reach down and touch it when you put, put something on here that's a little bit out of balance, not too much, but enough that it'll, you know, make it rock a little bit. And you can go down here at the foot and you'll feel what they call is the soft foot, the one that's not really in contact with the floor. And you just got to adjust it, turn the speed up and down and play with it. Now there is something called uh, harmonics that you'll get to a certain speed with a certain block. The lathe will start shimmying and dancing. Sometimes you slow it down, but every now and then you can speed it up because it has to do, I, I can't explain it because I'm not an engineer, but all those things moving together, there's a certain frequency where these things will work in concert and make it vibrate. I have had a piece that's so big and like that, and then you go in it with a tool, and you walk your leg over two feet. And John has that because he, he says the bottom of the, 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 the tool Leveling feet are uh, that nylon, nylon or some kind of plastic, right? What? I believe. Yeah. Didn't you say it had those nylon feet that caused it to shimmy across the floor if it if it was out of balance? Nice cheese. I don't have any problem with that. Okay. So he removed the leveling feet. Uh, okay. But anyway, uh, if you got a hard surface and you got nylon on it, 
and and it's not adjusted, you're more likely to get, you know, get that uh, shimming and, and dancing. Now, when I had when I first bought my Pyromatic, I was real fortunate. I had two engineers in my neighborhood to help me. They were retired to help me put it put the thing together. One of them was a this is a true story. Uh, one of them was an electrical engineer, and the other guy was a mechanical engineer that worked in in paper plants. He was from Canada. And the guys, the electrical engineers, reading the instruction manual on how you fasten the legs on it, and says, "Well, you lay this on the floor, and you turn it upside down. You put the legs on it, and then you roll it up." And and the other, the other, the mechanical engineer looked at him like he had three heads. It's like, this is a very fine-tuned piece of cast iron. We're not rolling this around on the concrete floor. <laughs> and 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 he made sure everything was perfectly level, and it was just flawless. Well. Roll forward 14 years, and I get a new Pyromatic, and, and I got a couple of the guys that bought my old one carrying it off, and they were in a hurry because they had a business to run, and, and so I, d I couldn't keep them very, very long, and we slapped the thing together, and it was good enough until I put a out-of-balance bowl blank on it, and the thing was really dancing. It's like, this lathe weighs 100 pounds more than my old one. It's basically the same model, 100 pounds. And it was dancing. It's like, okay, I got to stop what I'm doing and level the legs. And that's when I made this video. It's like, how do I lift this thing up to, to drop that, uh, that leveling leg? I'm by myself. There's nobody I can call on. I didn't have a jack. Well, I wound up thinking about it a little bit, and I wound up getting a, I had a, a, a cast iron splitting wedge. And I just put that splitting wedge under there and just tapped it with a mallet just to raise it up enough, adjust it, tapped it out, and, and it didn't take, take long. Or I could have stopped what I was doing, driven across town, go to Harbor Freight or whatever, and bought a jack for that one-shot deal, but that's not my style. <laughs> There's lots of different ways to solve problems. We all have our style. I could do that. That's, a good, that's, a, that's an excellent point. When we talk about leveling a lathe, I always thought you, you should, and it's not a bad idea, to start with a level. I didn't bring one with me, but you can level it this way and you can level it this way. But you don't have to do that. The real issue is all four legs evenly pressured on the floor. Because if it's tilted a little bit, it won't make any difference. But if it's not level and it's heavy, this cast iron can rack. That means it's going to twist like this. And that's what causes those things not to, to line up. So if we, if we get, get this... And we get this. You get a block of wood uh -huh. and a crowbar. And By yourself. Oh, it's not hard to do. Okay. I, may, I, I need to listen. I may make a video out of this. You get a crowbar, a block of wood, get it up underneath there, pick the one leg, whatever you got to do, and just work it one leg at a time. Yeah. That's how you need it, though. You need either a tub or a block of wood and a crowbar or a steel bar. Okay. So, so the so the lesson of this story is you use what you got in a little common sense and you can you might be able to figure it out. If not, call John and he'll come help you. I don't know what their weight limits are, but they got their little air pillows now. You can put pressure on. Yeah. 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 Tom is talking about an an air pillow they've got. You, you know, they they don't go real big, but they're real strong, and you can get. Multiple. But again, you know, if you want to pay, I've seen those, and I saw an article about it. It's like, yeah, if you want to pay fifty dollars for some one one shot deal, yeah, you can do that. Well, the ones I got to move <laughs> when we had to install my gas stove that weighed yeah. Have night. you ever used it a second time? Yes. Have you? Okay. Well, it turned out <laughs> there, there were only like twelve dollars at, at Home Depot. They okay. They lift three hundred and fifty pounds. Yeah. So we used four of them. And how much were they? About. I think it was somewhere between. So it's almost $50 for the solution I solved with, with a, a splitting wedge I already had. So go. the issue is use what you got. Use a little common sense. There's more than one way to do it, all right? All right, so this is what Jerry's talking about. Do they match? This one matches, you know, real, real close, real close. Um, if they don't match and it's a big lathe, there's a good chance there's, it's uneven, and you've got to really work on those legs to get rid of that racking. Now, the other possibility is on some of these mini lays where the, you don't have a moving headstock, and the, the headstock is mounted 
with four screws, it is possible that you can put a little tiny brass shim under one corner to change that position. That's, that's a potential solution. I have heard of people talking about putting a shim under here, but it's like you've got to be futzing with it all the time. So, you know, a permanent solution. Uh, th there is a way to do it. There are some lathes that I've seen where instead of having the four screws come in from the top on the headstock, there's somehow you can get up under it with those screws and you can actually adjust that, that, that one of those corners of the headstock to, to, to bring those things you know, back back in, in alignment. Make Michael? The kind of money, bulls are going to slide the head to the far end and do the same check. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 yeah, 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 exactly. Because it, it could be different in one position. Um, me, you know, you can get, you can, you can spend a lot of time on things and solve a problem you may or may not have. If it's where you're normally turning, and you're not causing it, and, and, and it works, then it works. And, you know, I wouldn't spend any more hey, time Mike, on it. It's, it's eight getting minutes close. till nine. Then we're getting real close. Um, the only other thing I'd want to mention is uh, servicing your, your chuck. A couple of things, just I'll just mention a couple of things in passing. If you never change chuck jaws, take your wrench and check them to make sure they're snug. Let me tell you, it's really scary when you pick up a chuck and you see one of the screws were, they were missing, and you think, uh-oh, what if the other screw was loose or was missing? Because you think about a piece of wood hurting you, this could kill you. So you, you want to you wanna check that. The other thing with those, you can there's something called anti-seize grease. You can get your automotive store. It's not real expensive. You buy a tube, it'll last your life. When you take the screws out, take a um, Q-tip and put just a little bit on there and just put a little bit on the screw. You don't have to do that every time you change jaws. Probably not a bad idea, but if you're changing jaws, it, it, it helps to clean the, 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 the place where the screw goes and put just a little bit of this on, on the screw. Doesn't take much, just a little bit. And that will keep it from, from the rust or dirt or, or uh, moisture getting in there and oxidizing where you can't get the screw out and you wind up stripping the screw and then that becomes a real maintenance uh, nightmare trying to get a, a, the, the screw loose. That was pretty much everything I wanted to cover. Any other lasting last minute questions before we wrap it up? Okay, thanks for having me.